we're here with uh, Matt Sorum, the drummer from Guns N' Roses, The Cult, Bell Revolver, and Camp Freddy. So, uh, we're going to do an interview. So the first question is, uh, how old were you when you first started playing the drums? Well, I uh, first started getting interested in drums. I saw Ringo Starr on the Ed Sullivan Show when I was six years old. And I remember pointing to the television and saying, Mommy, Mommy, I want to do that. <laughs> right? I guess it was sort of like like kids, you know, when you see something that interests you, like if a fire engine goes by and you go, I'm going to be a fireman, or see a train, I'm going to be a conductor. I, I just gravitated towards Ringo Starr, the drummer, you know. And after that, uh, for Christmas, I got my first snare drum, and then I... I got a little drum kit actually, a very small little drum kit called uh, Sears Tigger Tiger and it had a snare and like a little bass drum and I banged around on that. And then I got very involved in it around 9, 10 years old. I started taking lessons and stuff. So the second question is, how did you get so unbelievably great at <laughs> drums? Well, thank you, but uh, you know, a lot of practice. Um, started taking a lot of lessons and, and in those days uh, I had music classes in school quite a few you know in high school especially I had wind ensemble orchestra and marching band I mean uh, no sorry wind ensemble jazz band and marching band so I in those days you could take as many electives as you wanted in certain areas right so I chose all music and took three classes a day in school of music and then also studied and put my first band together when I was about 13 or 14 and started playing parties and that's all I did, you know, really. How long would you practice a day? Do you remember? Well, my parents would get home from work at about 6 o'clock so I used to run home from school from about 2.30 until 6 because my mom and Dad would come home and they'd be like, okay, you know. <laughs> I didn't play as much when they were home because, you know, they needed to relax and yeah. stuff. So I would play three to four hours a day. Oh, wow. And then, you know, after I got a band, we would start practicing at other people's places. And I, we'd practice a lot, like, you know, on weekends, all day, and as much as possible. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you still practice a lot like this? Well, I don't, I don't say I practice as much. I'm always working, like, and I'm always doing, what I try to do now is I try to diversify, meaning I, I try to work with a lot of musicians, you know, and it, it keeps me sharp. And then I challenge myself a lot. Like, I'll do projects that are maybe, in my opinion, a little bit out of my uh, comfort zone. Like, I did an album for the Buddy Rich Orchestra, which is on Atlantic Records, and it was with the big band, you know, yeah. horns and... Jazz, more of a jazz big band thing and I'm really known as a rock drummer but it was a stretch for me and I was really nervous coming into it even though I've been playing most of my life so I try to challenge myself and I've done movie scores I've produced and I play as many different styles as possible so I guess that's my my practice is that I challenge myself yeah. hmm. um, how did you join Guns N' Roses? Uh, Guns N' Roses, I joined in 1990. What happened was I was playing with a band called The Cult, which was a very famous band from England. And I moved to England, being a California kid. I grew up in Orange County. I auditioned for The Cult here in Los Angeles, but they were English. So I moved back to England, and I lived there in London, which was kind of cool. It was, I'd never been out of the country, you know. And I toured all around the world. It was my first world tour. We opened for Metallica and Aerosmith. And, you know, we played huge places, you know, and it was really cool. And then the very last show, I was in L.A., and two of the guys from Guns N' Roses came to the show backstage, and I saw Slash. Grab the top hat. <laughs> he walked in, and I said, hey, how you guys doing? They saw me play, and then about... About two months later, after I got off the road, I got a phone call. I was actually at my mom's house, because that's where I was living. I had no, no home at that point. I was just touring, touring, touring. 
And my mom said, there's a guy on the phone, his name's Slushers. Slash or something. I said, huh? So I got on the phone and Slash was on the line. He said, hey, I saw you play and I really like your drumming. Will you come audition for Guns N' Roses? And I said, what have you, a drummer? And they, they had to let him go. And I replaced Stephen Adler in 1990 and went on to record and tour all over the world with that band for about six years. What's it feel like playing in front of? Hundred thousand people. Well, I had the warm up with the cult. You know, I've been doing the biggest show I did with the cult was probably about fifty thousand. But see, if you can imagine, I went from playing small clubs in L.A. at you know two, three, four hundred people uh, at best to twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand with the cult, and then my first show with Guns N' Roses was one hundred fifty thousand. Wow, and. That was at Rock and Rio, Brazil, and that was, I, was, I gotta say, I was a little nervous. I, a little bit. But when you get start getting in that big of a venue, I mean, there's really no difference between 20 and 100,000. It's still a lot of people, you know, so. So it was, yeah, I mean, I, but I gotta tell you, it was pretty exciting, you know, really exciting. And I, I, I you know, as a kid, that's all I dreamed about, so. You know, I grew up with bands like Led Zeppelin and the Rolling Stones. That's what I wanted, you know? So I was there and I'm like, wow, I'm here, you know? So you looked up, up to them when you were practicing? Oh, yeah. Well, my, a lot of my practice and my focus was on uh, albums, you know? What I w really wanted to sort of take in as a musician was trying to be a musician all around, not just a great drummer. I wanted to be more of like a Ringo Starr or a John Bonham where I played songs. I'm a song drummer. A lot of musicians pride themselves on certain things, but I I really like being in a band. I like doing the song justice, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And uh, I've had the opportunity to meet Ringo since then, and I've said to him, you know, he never really got as much credit as I thought he deserved. Ringo Starr, you know, he's a Beatle. Yeah. But he wasn't like, you wouldn't be like, wow, he's the most amazing drummer, but if you listen to the songs, he gave a lot to the song, if you know my, my meaning. Uh, so I always try to play it and listen to the rest of the music and give it the best interpretation of what I felt lent itself, instead of trying to be a showboat or right. whatever, you know. So, so yeah. when, you're, when you listen to a new song, how do you go about making a musical drum trap for it? Well, when I listen, I listen, like I said, I listen to all the instruments, but I listen to the basses the most. And the bass usually really connects with my bass drum, you know, so if I'm listening to the bass, that's happening down here. And then all the top line instruments, like the guitars and things like that, I play up in this area, snare and cymbals. And then when I do drum fills, I never do drum fills while the vocals are happening. So I always let the singer sing, right? Yeah. And then if I get my little space, if I, the vocal stops and there's no instruments, and I've got my whole, that's when I decide to do my fill and set up sections, right? For instance, if there's a verse, if you're singing the verse, da -da 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 comes the chorus. It's always about setting up the sections, right? And I'll show you in a little bit on the drum kit. But... So I try to listen. The main thing about being in a band and being a great band drummer is being a good listener. I think that's like that in life, right? Yeah. So if you listen, you take all that and turn it into something great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is the rock star experience all it lives up to be? Well, you, yeah, if you want to be the rock star and do that, yes, it can be. <laughs> um, yes, I think so. I mean... The life, the life I've lived has been uh, a dream. I almost look at it like watching somebody else's movie, you know. Um, I can't believe I was there. <laughs> if you can get my drift, I mean, I've been all over the world, you know, ten times. I've played everywhere from, you know, Prague, Czechoslovakia, to Japan, to Australia, you know, uh, South America. And the beauty of it is fans embraced it all over you. So you were able to see that music is really a common thread that 
could be a very powerful force that brings us all together, you know? Yeah. That's the beauty of it. And, and it, what I realized later on in my life is that my music actually somehow helps people get through their everyday, you know, experience, you know what I mean? And I didn't really, at the time, being a rock star or whatever you want to call it, um, sometimes you can get caught, you know, if you get caught up in that whole, you're on this whirlwind, right? You're in a jet, you're flying, you're in your limo, you know. Yeah. That part of it can, can be a little wild. And, you know, my band Guns N' Roses was pretty well known for being kind of wild, so we did that. Yeah, but, you know, at the time it seemed right. But um, in retrospect, looking back at it, you know, we did exactly what we were supposed to do at the time. And the whole thing about rock and roll and that kind of a, uh, a band was the idea of celebration and freedom, you know, so the, the representation of rock and roll means be yourself, be who you want to be, be free, be celebrate, because life is a celebration, and that's really what we represented, you know, don't let someone tell you what you think you're, you know, you're supposed to do, you know, do, do what you feel, right? <laughs> so, uh, I know you, you're trying to bring music to public schools. Can you tell me a little about that? Yeah, I am. I'm, uh, well, I'm very concerned with uh, what's happening in public schools and music's being cut, you know, which I think is a travesty. And they're taking music away from the kids um, and they're going to have less and less music programs. So I've created a, a nonprofit called Adopt the Arts and I'm working with Jane Lynch, the actress from Glee. She's going to be my spokesperson. And we're going to raise funding and money to bring teachers uh, more more funding for them to be able to stay in public schools. So we're starting. So far, we've got two schools in the LA school district, and we're going to work up to as many as possible and try to independently fund the teaching program. And then I also have a musical instrument program called Global Sound Lodge, where I bring instruments to schools, which I've already done three in LA. And I bring, I bring instruments to shelters and orphanages around the world. I've, I've got a trip to Pakistan planned. I've got a trip to, uh, to Brazil, Haiti, Nepal. Just bringing music to people that maybe can't get their hands on an instrument and give them some feeling of what we get to experience playing music, you know? Yeah. I think it's... It's a great healing force. I mean, it's there's no sort of politics behind it. It's not a political statement in any region. Everybody enjoys the same thing. You know, I believe in the teachings of John Lennon or John Coltrane, the great jazz saxophone player. I believe that music could heal the world, and I believe that's true. I just think the more music, the better, not less, more. <laughs> so. That's what I'm trying to do with that. And it's it's a great thing because, like I said, when I've traveled the world, I've seen it firsthand. So I know it's possible. It's just a matter of, you know, if you were to take a, a consensus about people around the world, right, that have different political or religious beliefs, if you sat them all in one room and said, do you like this music? And probably 99% of them would say, yeah. There might be one guy that just doesn't like music. I don't know why. But he might want to, he probably wants to get therapy or something else, but the therapy is the music, right? Yeah. So, it's a pretty strong statement, you know, so I think we all feel the same way. Music makes us smile, music makes us happy, right? How much joy do you get when you play the drums? I love it. I'm free, I can do whatever I want. How good does it feel, right? Yeah. It's like, it kind of goes through your whole... Body, it's like a physical, mental um, connection. You know, you have this physical feeling, but you also have this mental, right? Yeah, it relieves all the stress. Yeah.